para to the data. So good morning. Today is Friday, March 26th. It's 9 a.m. This is a meeting of the Senate Natural Re Resources and Energy Committee. And we are taking testimony this morning. Um, the, the named topic is the bill uh, S-119, an act relating to community energy. Um, and uh, that's part of what I uh, shared with the list of witnesses today. But I also ask people to think more broadly than the bill. The bill being, in part, just a placeholder to get a conversation started about how we might deliver more renewable energy to more, more Vermonters at a lower cost. Um, and uh, so the other series of related questions that I had sent off to our guests this morning related to how would you define uh, you know, Vermont's renewable energy challenge or problem? Um, and what recommendations do you have for um, addressing it? So um, we'll see where folks go. Uh, we have a variety of perspectives from the developer and uh, um, as well as the utility side. Um, so it should be an interesting conversation. And with that, uh, let me pause and just check in one other housekeeping piece of business. Senator Parent is offering an amendment on S-101 on topics uh, within the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, it's on the floor for in today's uh, calendar. So I asked him to come to committee to explain <clears throat> the proposed amendment uh, and he'll be in shortly after 11, we have floor at 11.30. So um, any, Committee questions before we get going? Okay, well, great. Good to see you all. Um, so first up is uh, uh, Mr. Castengay of um, Green Mountain Power. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I omitted one thing and that is, because <laughs> uh, I'm looking at the agenda and it's um, Ms. Chikowski. I had asked uh, if you could um, join us to do a, uh, a walkthrough of the bill, which, um, and if you could pick sort of a middle altitude, um, because so much of it is up in, in play still that we don't know what level of detail we'll get into, but it'd be good for everyone in the room to have an idea of how this bill works, uh, just as a, a starting point, uh, for the conversation today. So if it could turn first to you uh, for a bill walkthrough, that would be helpful. Thank you. Sure. Um, so Ellen Jaikowski, Office of Legislative Counsel, S-119 is the bill. Do you want me to put it on the screen? Would that be easy? Uh, yes, yes, please. Thanks, because okay. I'm not sure if everyone's uh, looked through or not yet. Sure. So it is still as introduced. Um, this bill is only one section and it's adding a, that's not true. It's first adding a new definition, um, but then what it's doing is adding a new section to Title 30 in Chapter 89, the Renewable Energy Chapter. And it is adding a, uh, a section on community energy plants. So first, the first section defines what that means so it's a renewable energy plant that would qualify as a group net metering system, but for its capacity uh, that has a plant capacity greater than 500 kilowatts and less than five megawatts. And that is commissioned on or after July 1, 2022. So these are new systems. And then there is this section, which adds a new section to chapter 89, um, a community energy program. So the structure of this language is, is fairly similar to the net metering statute that's in 8010, the section immediately preceding that. Um, so uh, it's setting up a fairly prescriptive system, but it's also directing the PUC to adopt rules filling in some of the details. So, um, 
community energy program is established, uh, a community energy plant shall receive net metering treatment if it is approved by the Public Utility Commission and complies with the requirements of this section. The purpose is to encourage renewable energy through bill credits for the production of such energy, uh, to stabilize the value of those credits over time in relation to the renewable energy plant generating the energy, and to use economies of scale and a different bill credit structure to produce renewable energy at a lower cost than net metering. So then section C sets a, starts um, listing parameters for the bill credits. So each customer associated with a community energy plant shall receive credit on their bill for the energy generated by the plant. This credit shall be reverted to the um, retail electricity provider unless used within a certain period of time, which will be prescribed by the commission in their rules. The amount of the credit shall be consistent with a base rate per kilowatt hour and adjustments as set forth in this section. So first there is a base rate uh, that is prescribed. So the base rate shall be the avoided costs of the interconnecting retail electricity provider as of the date on which a community energy plant applies to the commission for approval under this section. Um, Avoided costs has a very specific definition when used in terms of renewable energy. Um, it's used elsewhere in uh, chapter 89. So that's a, a pretty standard formula that I think the PUC uses regularly. Um, but then in addition to the base rate, there are adjustments to the bill credit um, as provided by this, these sections. <clears throat> so first, there is a positive adjustment to the base rate for constructing community energy on a preferred site. And the commission shall establish preferred sites for the program based on considerations identified in 8005, which is the um, standard offer program section and uh, preferred sites set forth in the uh, net metering titles, uh, the net metering rules under this title. <laughs> So um, I looked at uh, the net metering rules yesterday and the standard offer. And so most of these preferred sites um, include dis areas that have already been disturbed, um, parking lots, uh, gravel pits and quarries, or areas identified by a town in a town plan. So uh, this is directing the commission to establish a similar set of preferred sites for these systems. Uh, then there is a negative adjustment to the base rate if the plant will be sited in a constrained area. So where the transmission or distribution system um, is constrained and a positive adjustment for siting in areas that um, possess adequate capacity for transmission and distribution. So um, looking at uh, areas of the state that have um, constraints on the grid. Uh, then there is a positive adjustment to the rate if the plant will provide services um, to the transmission and di or distribution system, such as helping to maintain proper flow and direction of electricity, address imbalances between supply and demand, or enable the system to recover after event that negatively affects the uh, system function. Uh, then uh, there shall be a positive adjustment if the to the base rate if the community energy uh, plant will supply a majority of its bill credits to one or more customers of the following type, uh, residential, municipal, educational, or nonprofit organizations. Uh, so, specific customers there. And then again in E, a positive adjustment to the base rate if it will supply bill credits to a commercial or industrial per, uh, customer. The served premise of the account to receive the credits is, is in close proximity to the plant and other customers of the interconnecting utility will not bear any costs to interconnect the served premises. Or if the commission determines that the benefits outweigh the costs. 
uh, then there is a positive adjustment to the base rate if there are if the renewable energy credits uh, generated by the plant will be transferred to the interconnecting retail electricity provider and used to meet their obligations under the renewable energy standard. And finally, the commission may establish other um, adjustments to the base rate uh, that they consider consistent with this section. So um, next, the stability, the bill credit amount for the plant approved under the section shall be determined at the time the plant applies for approval and shall remain the same for that plant for the 20 years following the date of commissioning. Associated customers, the application for a community energy plant shall identify the customers who will receive the bill credits for the energy to be produced by the plant and other such information concerning the customers <clears throat> as the commission may require. Cumulative capacity phases. Uh, in accordance with this subsection, the commission shall allow um, plants into the program until the program reaches a cumulative plant capacity amount <clears throat> of 250 megawatts. This, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> this um, <clears throat> um, capacity shall have two phases. First, a 50 megawatt plant capacity phase, and then the second phase will have a capacity of 250 megawatts. <clears throat> the commission shall not accept applications for phase two until phase one is allocated. Uh, then the, the Department of Public Service shall file a, an annual report on or before January 15th of each year starting in 2023. Uh, it shall include the amount of capacity approved under the program, the range from lowest to highest of bill credit amounts authorized, <clears throat> a summary of the types and sizes of community energy plants approved under the program, and such other information as the commissioner may consider relevant. The report shall be committed, uh, submitted to the House Committee on Energy and your committee, as well as finance. <clears throat> sale of power. A community energy plant may sell a portion of the power it generates through a power purchase agreement or other wholesale transaction. Rules. The commission shall implement the program by rule except that it may establish and revise adjustments um, under the, the uh, bill of credit adjustment section through periodic issuance of an order after notice and opportunity for public comment. The rules issued to implement the program shall include the following a process for applying for and obtaining commission approval for a plant, the transfer of, of CPGs issued for community energy plants and abandonment of such plants, the respective duties of retail electricity providers, the holders of CPG for community energy plants and customers receiving bill credits, the electrical safety, power quality, interconnection and metering of community energy plants, the resolution of disputes between customers receiving bill credits from the plants and the interconnecting provider, and the billing, crediting, and disconnection of customers from the provider. The resolution of disputes between customers receiving bill credits and holders of CPGs for the plants. The manner in which bill credits for community energy plants will be applied on a customer's bill, including those charges on the bill to which the credit may not apply and the period in which the customer must use the bill credits after which they revert to the provider. And so finally, the act shall take effect on July 1, 2021, uh, but the commission shall file its rules for this new program on or before January 1, 2022. Great. So I went a little bit fast through that, but I think yeah. you've already talked about some of it. Yep, thank you. That was just, I think, probably the perfect s speed. Uh, let us take a look in a little more detail without 
uh, pausing, although uh, to get into the, the details. Um, for the most part, I just wanted to make sure everyone had it fresh in mind um, as we start today's conversation. So thank you very much. But before we go on, do any members of the committee have questions for council? Okay, uh, Senator McDonald. I just, does council need to go get a glass of water? <laughs> Can we give her a moment? Or yes, I'm, so, I'm sorry. I have, my allergies are bad this week. So maybe if while she's, well, council is doing that. Um, Okay. As a sponsor um, of the, the, the goals seem to be designed to avoid some of our past concerns and, and put a lot of responsibility on the PUC. So right. to, to work those things out, but, um, and I was just doing that as filler. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, so I'm done. Okay. Well, do you have a question for council as well? No. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, by way of explanation, you know, uh, especially going through it like that relatively quickly, it, to me, it highlights many of the discussions we've had over net metering. This is almost like a net metering big brother uh, or um, program, larger scale, uh, a different base in order to try to bring down the cost, a, a value stack of different values that reflect areas of contention and opportunity that we've heard about in the last year, for instance, that um, an array built under this might have a positive adjuster if it had associated battery storage, particularly if that battery storage were under the control of the distribution utility to which it was delivering power. So it's in a way it's trying to contemporize uh, a larger scale version of metering. Um, but as I thought about it getting you know, ready for today or when I, um, asked you to invite folks in for this week. I also realized that it, I'm suffering maybe a little bit from the myopia of having heard about net metering for a decade and that uh, people may wanna bring a whole fresh vision to how we would deliver more uh, economical, broad, well-priced, well-situated uh, community power to Vermonters and I would say the, the newer lens that it's always been there, but it's much more visible and people are thinking about it more this year, um, addressing low income Vermonters and including them in the, all this energy transformation work. So the, the bill is really offered up as a, a way to prompt a conversation today and uh, genuinely interested to hear what our, all our witnesses have to, um, to share with us. Um, the other thing is I want to apologize for a little confusion. I had an earlier version of the agenda up. So uh, I, while <clears throat> in the last 10 minutes, I pulled up today's actual agenda. So I, I was not proposing to change the order of, of, from, of hearing from folks. And um, with that, I go back. So anyone who texted me saying, what's up with the changing the batting order? <laughs> that was my mistake. Um, okay. If there are no questions for Mr. Chikowsky, thanks very much for walking us through. And then we'll go uh, to um, Ms. Campbell Anderson. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for having us. I just wanna make sure everyone's hearing me okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And um, so just for the record, my name's Olivia Campbell Anderson. I um, have the pleasure of leading Renewable Energy Vermont. Uh, REVS members are working every day to create resilient local economies powered by renewable energy. We employ a 21st century workforce that's committed to improving the lives of our neighbors and communities. And we're all working together to achieve 100% total renewable energy in Vermont for electricity, heating, cooling, and transportation. Um, I want to, uh, let, me, let me go ahead, I'm gonna do a, my screen share here. All right. right, are you guys, okay. 
Yes, so, ma'am. Uh, thank you. So I, I really just, I want to talk a little, I want to, I'm taking your lead, Senator Bray, and in not talking about the details of the proposed legislation, but stepping back to talk about the problems and the opportunities and the barriers to realizing those opportunities and some solutions about what other states are doing um, and what Vermont could do to lower energy costs and increase local energy resilience. So state policy really drove and drives Vermont's clean energy, uh, both in the past and the present and the future. Um, citizen owned engaged participation has been core to Vermont's local energy economy and our overall energy innovation. That was really a, a policy that set out by the legislature quite wisely. Um, and that enabled growth, you know, it worked. We now have uh, more than 6,114 Vermonters working in renewable electricity, uh, employing their, uh, supporting their families with living wage, beyond living wage jobs, which are exactly the kind of work we want in our state. Um, when we cut carbon pollution, we create jobs in Vermont. As renewable energy technology has matured, it's now dynamic. It's much more price competitive than it was. You know, past state policy, like with net metering, is not the present. Even net metering has changed drastically from what it was. Um, so I just want you to come to this with a, a mindset thinking about, you know, the past is, is not the present or our future. Um, but our current policy tools have become stale as you've rec recognized. Um, the standard offer is concluding uh, probably next year. It will run its course. Um, it has a legislative sunset, a total capacity reached by the end of next year, I suspect. Net metering is significantly diminished. Um, and the legislature's vision and intent for democratized citizen and local business led energy movement is, is starting to slip away, is slipping away from us. Um, I want to focus and turn to focus on our, our problems that we can address. The, we've got limited tools in our toolbox, as you've recognized, to continue local renewable energy progress and increase our energy resilience. State policy and programs aren't really working as well as they could. Um, so maybe it's time for some new tools and some updating of our current tools. Um, we want to make sure that every Vermonter can benefit, and we are definitely having equitable access, particularly for low-income households, uh, which is a gap right now. Uh, we want to um, increase our resilience. Uh, it, there is value to customer and locally owned. There's tremendous value to leverage private capital for people who want to invest in this because um, they can save ratepayer dollars by doing that, investing private capital instead of ratepayer dollars um, and leverage federal tax credits now while they're available. Um, so we also have a situation where we effectively have no true community solar left um, due to public utility commission changes to net metering. So there's a lot of customers as you've rightly identified that would like to get more local renewable electricity, generate their own and they can't. And so we do need a new tool to enable them to cost effectively do so. Um, and we need clear vision and direction on ways that from the legislature to enable more local resilient renewable energy. If we're gonna be successful in stopping burning fossil fuels to heat our homes and move around, we need more local renewables in Vermont. It takes time to build energy infrastructure so that we're ready to fully power and realize the economic benefits uh, and capture those economic benefits here in Vermont rather than shipping them out of electricity, for heating, cooling, and vehicles. And they're gonna ramp up way faster than we think, um, that, than we're planning for. Um, and, and the more, we really need to generate more locally so that we can retire old gas and nuclear, which we are still relying on um, in New England. Um, we've got a situation now where 
The Vermont policy, as I mentioned, has kind of become stale. It's really no longer encouraging and supporting um, new local renewable generation at levels that we need to meet our commitments. Um, uh, we've got a couple of other key issues. Electricity costs are increasing, um, largely due to regional transmission and ISO New England charges. Uh, the current renewable energy standard, uh, the way that it's being implemented, it's limiting local distribution to just 10% of Vermont's energy needs, which really stifles our self-sufficiency and our local economic opportunity and climate resilience. Uh, Vermont, as you can see in this slide, Vermont is experiencing more frequent and intense storms due to climate change, and that reduces electricity reliability and increases costs for everyone. We face, we are facing, it's not a, this is not a question of climate change is coming, it's already here. We are experiencing real and substantial costs on our electric system due to the impact of extreme weather, which is more frequent weather and more severe storms. Direct storm costs and customer interruptions due to electricity outages cost Vermonters more than $375 million over the last five years. That's about $285 for every GMP customer every year. So for context to these numbers, because I know it's hard when you hear big numbers to be like, okay, what's, what really is that? You know, that, that, that amount of money is about a quarter of the state's transportation fund budget every year. Um, our existing grid's grossly inefficient. It's only 43% efficient, meaning by bringing in power from far away, we're losing a lot of electricity. Um, and Vermont imports 60% of its electricity, cons uh, consuming almost four times as much energy as we produce overall. We are sending hundreds of millions of dollars out of the state every year. We could, we have the, we have the technology and the ability to generate at least 50% of our electricity that we need in Vermont with renewable technology that's available today. That would be a tremendous shift in local economic opportunity for our state. Um, so want to um, highlight a couple of benefits. I know that um, there, there's some new data and analysis that's come out over, um, over the summer that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I'm just gonna go through this quickly uh, about we really need, um, I've already mentioned we really need to plan now and start to support the future to meet our climate commitments and create more sustainability. Uh, I've mentioned that we've got a problem with resilience. Um, the benefits of local solar have, there was a new study done by Synapse Energy Economics when ISO New England released data um, for the first time that we could uh, analyze um, the tremendous benefits that local solar provides all Vermonters. So oh, from 2014 to 2019, small scale solar, and when I say small scale solar, I mean five megawatts and less, um, uh, which is really Vermont scale. We don't have much that's uh, larger than five megawatts, right? Um, so in terms of electricity cost savings, Vermonters saved more than $75 million over the last five years from the local solar we've already deployed. Not only is local solar effectively lowering our electric bills for everyone, but it's also reduced public health and climate risks. When Vermont and New England get our electricity from local solar, it needs we need less electricity from fossil fuel power plants, and that makes up the large majority of the ISO New England grid mix. So when solar is generating in Vermont, we are literally turning off dirty power in New England. And that brings real dollars back to Vermont. Um, when those power plants operate less, they create fewer emissions. Nitrogen, sulfur dioxide, particulate matter, causes asthma attacks, heart attacks, premature death. These public health impacts have economic costs. And over the last five years, the solar that we've deployed in Vermont has avoided millions of pounds of emissions, creating over $93 million in public health benefits in Vermont. 
And that continues every single year that solar is running. So more solar also means less carbon pollution. Um, last year, last five years, solar in New England um, took roughly uh, half uh, cut carbon by about half of all of the emissions that occurred in Vermont in 2016. So I, I just want to dis, dis I just want to um, dispel the myth that local renewables does not help us meet our climate commitments and we don't have more work to do. Vermont's installed solar created 22 million in carbon benefits and it removed the equivalent of 42,000 cars from the road. Um, these savings notably were enjoyed not only by people with solar, but everyone with an electric bill. In 2019, and we've been able to quantify this down to the household level, 2019, solar, local solar, provided more than $150 million a year in cost savings and benefits to every Vermont household. Um, so if it wasn't Mr. for- Chair, yeah. Mr. Mr. Chair, I, the witness is biting off more than I can chew. Um, and that's my shortcoming. And I'm not, we, the witness started out telling us the sort of the problems that we're with our current system. And it, it has moved into, um, has gone beyond my capacity to understand all the problems before being, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just, get back to problems. I, I'm gonna get to solutions because, and problems. And I, and Am I going too fast? Things, each one of the things that are coming up, I think we need to understand better. And I, I'm i just, I'm making a list of stuff I don't understand. So. And my hat's off to her because she knows what she's talking about. I just don't know how to digest it this quickly. Um, uh, so I thank you, Senator McDonald. It is, there's a lot of data here. Um, uh, Ms. Campbell, probably the, uh, let me just, Campbell Anderson, sorry. Uh, let me check in and what's the, I know you've submitted written testimony. Um, do you have, is there, but I don't see some of the figures you're going through in that. Do you have a written version of yeah, some I of did. your notes that so you could share I, with us after? I also did share this fact sheet that's highlighting yep. this, this report and yep. I can resend the committee the whole detailed report. I just didn't want to you know, so these are just some highlights. I'm going to move on now and talk about the, you know, the storage in the future. And then I definitely would be very happy to um, spend more time with anybody answering questions uh, we, as we, we move ahead. We, we don't, you know, we need to have those questions answered with us here. We can't. Okay. This is a such a terrible median to try and resolve these things. And my, Mr. Chair, I'm going to ask a question, and then it may you may decide it's not worthy um, at this time. But the, the, the witness started out by saying we've done a lot of good work, and um, now um, some of our good work is is become a bit obsolete. Um, that's my interpretation, and the we often what have we done that was breaking, which, which was good work and has now become a white elephant that you, we are trying to replace with more good work. Um, it, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm Yeah, I hear so you. I, will, I hear I you. Stop. I want to maybe let me, um, let, let me keep going to get to that okay. because I've got okay. that question answered ahead, but I also really want to focus on the future. And particularly like new tools, how can we move ahead in a cost-effective way? At, sure. And and so okay, Senator McDonald, your question is is yes. spot on. And know, what have what we already is, done that we should stop defending if it's no longer defensible in order to do what you're going to share with us? Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thanks. And before we go on, uh, Senator McCormick, you had a question. Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> I, if, I'm, if I understand Senator McDonald's uh, complaint accurately, it seems to me that, that that's a complaint I have with our entire process every morning. It's, uh, 
<laughs> I wouldn't single this witness out. And uh, we are asked to, to take in um, a lot of information very, very quickly. And uh, I'd, I'd like to hear the presentation as she wishes to present it. Um, and let me just check with Ms. Uh, Campbell Anderson before going on. So there's an abbreviation here. I'm not sure we use it all the time in this committee. BTM, I think, is behind the meter solar, correct? Yes. Maybe you could and explain the term. So in, in, in context for um, this report, behind the meter solar is uh, something that's less than five megawatts. It's, that's how ISO New England interprets it um, uh, for purposes of the data that they released. Behind the meter means different things to different people, but for your, you know, understanding, just think what I'm talking about here is projects that are five megawatts and less, because those are really the projects where we, that size, anything less than five megawatts really creates these transmission and electrical benefits, reducing our charges from ISO New England. So when you think about the peak, solar is cutting that peak just like uh, energy efficiency. And um, it's determined part two that these are resources so small that they're not dispatched by ISO New England. So they just fill in and in essence, make our demand sort of magically seem to be less than it really is to ISO. Yes. yes, and Vermont's done an incredible job of that. And much to your credit, and, um, and Green Mountain Power supporting net metering and creating the standard offer program. Okay, so thanks. Let's go back to your presentation, thank you. Okay, thanks. So, um, so I'm gonna shift now and talk about how do we make it, how do we make the sun shine at night? We have the technology now to do that. We, um, so I, I'd like you to uh, essentially unleash the renewable technology that exists, which is called energy storage. We've done a great work with Green Mountain Power doing pilots on energy storage, and it's now time to create a statewide policy and a statewide market that is consistent and certain so that all Vermonters can access the benefits of renewable energy storage. This is the next frontier, um, which uh, Senator Bray, you've recognized in the bill as creating a positive adjuster for resilience. Anytime you hear resilience, think local renewables, think energy storage. And there are many different kinds, um, but I just, as you can see, these are all the benefits. Energy storage is like your Swiss army knife for electricity. It literally can do everything uh, when it's paired with local renewables um, and all the good things that we want to do and that we need to do more of to create a climate resilient grid to address some of those costs that I mentioned about the storms, which are only increasing. Um, so I'm not gonna read through each of these, but the benefits of renewable energy storage are significant. This is a graph that kind of shows you what I meant when I said, let's make the sun shine at night. Um, and, uh, or it can also, it also works for local hydro. It also works for local wind. Um, and so at night we're getting, we've been so successful um, with our deployment that we now have um, at certain times of day during certain days of the year, it's not all the time, um, but there are moments when we have more electricity than we need at that moment. We need to save it up. We need to put it in our electric vehicles and we can save it and we need to use it for heat pumps and smart, um, smart uh, buildings but we can also save that up into storage and use it during our peak times at night. And we're not doing that at a level that we could be or that would be cost effective for the whole state. So this is just a graph that shows you how that works. Um, and so the tremendous benefits that energy storage can provide Vermont are, um, are quite outstanding. Um, 
you know, backup power, money for rate payers. You've seen the press releases from Green Mountain Power saving millions of dollars every year. Um, I'm sure that Josh will speak to that in a little bit uh, from uh, from them. Um, and I know that Vermont Electric Co-op now has a, a, done one project for energy storage um, that's saving their rate payers. We need to do more of this on every level. Um, and not only does it help our citizens and our local businesses, I mentioned some of those costs every time the power goes out, how much it's costing our economy, but um, the, we are innovating and creating jobs that cannot be outsourced. We have a, um, a sector of manufacturers in Vermont of energy storage, um, DynaPower, Northern Power, Northern Reliability. They are manufacturing these products here in Vermont and deploying them all over the world. Now, they're not deploying many projects in Vermont. It's just a few and far between and really pilots. And we really need to ramp this up. This is a picture I just want to, I know that you've seen the headlines about what the horror that happened in Texas with the grid and outages. This is a picture from a Texas neighborhood. Um, the, the house that you, you can't really see it because it's so dark, but um, this is a neighborhood full of houses. The house that has the lights on and is keeping their family warm, that house has solar plus storage. And it's keeping the lights on, it's keeping the heat on for that family. In Vermont, if we had more solar plus storage, um, we keep Vermonters working both the ones that are deploying these technologies and the business that, that are operating or that can't operate every time we've got power issues. And we, as we saw in Texas, and even as we have seen in Vermont now, with our increased heat, I don't know if you realize, we've actually had heat deaths in Vermont from people elderly and individuals with vulnerable health. So we're getting to the point because of climate change that if you can keep your electricity on, you are literally keeping people alive. This is a serious public health need that we've got um, and that is going to come to us even more increasingly. And it's more important as we electrify for keeping our climate commitments going. So this is just a picture of Texas, you know, we don't want to be Texas. You know, we we could do more microgrids. Um, we have a couple pilot projects, the McKnight Lane, affordable housing. So let me keep going. Um, other states. Uh, so we like to think of ourselves as a leader in Vermont, but we have been leapfrog at tremendous levels. And other states are moving ahead to increase their resilience increase local jobs and climate action with local renewables plus storage. Um, there's quite a, a half dozen or more states are requiring energy storage procurement. And then our neighbors have legislation that's moving in Connecticut and Maine. So we are going to pay more for our electricity if we do not get moving on energy storage because Why of the charges. Why aren't it's not we moving? moving because we don't have statewide policy? Why? Well, that you get to vote on that. No, no, no. We get to vote on the policy. Why? What are we doing that blinds us to the question of how do we make the sun shine at night? Well, I think that's exactly why Senator Bray has introduced this bill, which I hope you'll move this session and we're, we're, enhance it. So we we need you to enact a state law that gets us moving and beyond the pilot phase. So yes, we need to do that. Why are we stuck at this point without the momentum to do that while other states are breezing past us? What is it our failure to introduce bills or is our, our failure to think about this I think or it's because you haven't stuck, passed bills. You know, you haven't passed back. bills. That's why you're having this conversation. So let's, I think we're, you know, we got to get moving. Um, so there's a lot of states that are offering financial incentives for energy storage. We at this time don't really think that we need to, um, with the exception of low income 
and areas where Vermonters can't um, make these investments uh, themselves and need help. Um, we, we don't think that we need to put state money towards energy storage. We just need you to open the market and let us build it because right now we, there's no market outside of what Green Mountain Power is doing. So a couple other things with California is requiring all new homes to install solar. Um, there are more than a dozen states that have either already passed a law or have a plan to get to 100% renewable electricity or carbon free. And look at the states on this list. I mean, some of these are our neighbors, Maine, um, New York, and some of these are not, are not bastions of um, progressive thinking. Virginia, you know. <laughs> um, so, so why are so, we not doing it? You'll have to ask your colleagues that. I, I, I hope you will do it. I'm asking you to do it. Um, a lot of other states, I really appreciate um, uh, Senator Bray's comments from a couple days ago and also your support for um, the Clean Energy Development Fund for low income solar. We really need to make sure that everyone can participate. Um, and so there's a lot of other states that have standing programs with where you have an adjuster on if you're participating for low income. Um, and so there's been a lot of other Massachusetts using energy efficiency dollars for energy storage, updating interconnection rules. This is a map of the, of the country where the states have already have in law um, storage procurement requirements. And this just shows you what those states are and what they are. Um, and so uh, this is not a novel concept. As you can see, look at that, look at New England. Vermont and New Hampshire are becoming an island and it is not a good island to be in because our electricity rates are going to increase. Um, so, uh, and if not for our collaboration with Green Mountain Power on storage, um, it would be far worse, but we, we need, I need you to open that up to enable, enable this to, to reach reality and those benefits. Um, so this is a quick overview. I want to, of what we need to do, why we're doing it. I wanna talk about specifics and then I'll, I'm wrapping up here, Senator Bray. I wanna be respectful of the committee's hey, time. I am getting a little concerned. We're going kind of long. Um, so this, these, when you asked for what do we need, what are the barriers um, so that we can move ahead and what would help us get more cost-effective uh, local renewables, what, what are the tools that we need? Um, we do need new and updated tools. We need legislative action. And here's, here's a list of some things that have been proposed, some things that aren't yet in law. Um, that could accompany or support your efforts. I'm not gonna go through them all in detail. Some of them I've talked about already. I do wanna highlight again, standard offer is ending. I really hope we can move uh, uh, this year um, that while you're getting the new tool of community solar program set up, continue standard offer until that new tool is standing. Um, because otherwise then you're gonna have a big gap. And with the federal tax credits for solar stepping down, um, we really want need to keep making progress step by step uh, uh, now and not, not have a gap, not have a stop uh, while we're waiting for the new community solar program. It probably will take a year or two to you know, be established um, in rulemaking, et cetera. So I'm asking that you keep standard offer going. Um, uh, and update it a little bit for at least three more years. Um, there are also some very specific things where we have our laws are not quite um, uh, the intent of the legislature. We've got some conflict and needing to update as we always do, um, you know, with how do we define plant and so that we can maximize those preferred locations that have been most of many of which have been identified in through 
Act 174 and town comprehensive planning for smart growth and siting. Um, we're, we're getting conflict where towns literally want certain areas to be um, designated as like a solar park. And the Public Utility Commission is saying, no, you can't put multiple plants right next to each other. And so that's not, that's not smart from a ratepayer perspective. It's not smart from a land use perspective. So that's one thing we need to update. We need more information about maps so we can put it on the grid where it costs less. You do not need an incentive or an adjuster that exists naturally with interconnection, but we, do, we just need the information so that we can maximize the grid that we've got. Um, I do believe every Vermonter should have a statutory right to generate their own electricity. And there are some other bills coming forward, um, uh, property tax certainty that is being discussed in Senate finance soon. Um, also uh, flexibility for agrivoltaics on current use property that's being discussed in Senate Agricultural Committee. Um, think about replenishing the Clean Energy Development Fund and allow solar to help you with your clean water goals and wetlands restoration. So I, with that, I want to just stop and take questions and, um, and thank you for your time. Um, we really could do so much more if policy directed it and enabled it. Um, we've got, you know, you've heard time and time again, you even said time and time again, we've got triple kick crisis in public health our economy and climate change. The benefits of local renewables can help us with all of these unprecedented generational challenges. Um, you know, local solar in New England eliminated pollution equal to half of the carbon emissions in Vermont. That is tremendous. If we tripled the amount of small scale solar in our state, we could cut electricity costs for all Vermonters by more than $42 million a year. And we can do it cost effectively if you give us the new tools to do it. You've got the technology. We just need you to set the policy. Okay. Um, thank you. I feel like I've been through a buffet line. There's a lot of material <laughs> here. Um, I, I have one question while you're sort of still in the chair, uh, because I carry around in my head all the voices of people who have different perspectives. One of the things we often hear from the utilities is that net metering forces them to buy uh, power at above market rates. So they, they treat that as a cost um, that then gets passed on to all rate payers. Um, but you've talked about delivering savings in the form of benefits. So can you reconcile one with the other? And I don't mean to turn this into a debate. I'm just trying to understand how you look at it. Sure. Well, I think when it's important to look at the holistic picture, you know, think about the cost that Vermont is experiencing when we are buying power from the grid, that power from our New England grid is is fossil fuels, large majority of it. And we are paying we might not be paying for that in our electric bill, but we are paying for it in our health bills. We are paying for it in uh, the cost of these storms. We are paying for it. And so if we can get to using more of that storage resource and more of the renewables, you know, I don't want to debate getting into net metering, but as you'll see from that detailed Synapse study, um, it, that the, the actual value of that local solar to Vermont, uh, when you think about the holistic benefits, is 20 cents a kilowatt hour. That is far higher than net metering compensation today, and that is far higher than um, uh, than uh, retail electric rates. And so I just think it's really important to think about this issue holistically. Uh, you know, and I could, um, you know, I could get into, into more details, but there's been um, some really questionable information about what is the cost and, right. uh, and, and so I'd be happy to, you know, address that at another time. Um, okay. I think that would, we'll have to do it at another time in order yeah. to sort of complete our survey this morning. 
you know, my sense is that <laughs> some of the some of the argument could just go away by acknowledging the fact that that power is more expensive compared to other choices utilities have and put that on the table along with the benefits and then let it sugar off from there. It seems like uh, I sense that one side and the other, if we want to call sides, don't want to acknowledge the other the other team's balance sheet. And if we just look at the full balance sheet, I think that's probably, that's what's actually in Act 62, you know, full cost benefit, full life cycle accounting as a metric for us to use. Um, Senator McCormick, last question to you, and then we need to move on. Thank you. And you are muted, you. sir. Thank you. It seems to me that often um, committee hearings uh, the question and answer section is like an old Bob and Ray routine where the the guy asking the questions is asking for stuff that the, has, that the answer has already talked about and uh, implying that he's not listening. But it's not that. It's that there's so much coming so fast. On, on storage, um, one of the arguments made uh, against green energy is, is that... Um, that storage has its own environmental downside. That some of the materials used in batteries, I presume you're talking about some kind of battery storage. And yeah, well, there's, there's actually a lot of different kinds of storage. Um, what's mostly being deployed right now is batteries, but it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be lithium. This technology is going to continue to evolve. Yeah. There's flow batteries, there's saltwater batteries. Um, there's, uh, there's also, as you can see here in this picture, this is, uh, I don't think Senator Campion's with us, but the Sonin battery uses phosphate, which is not using some of those chemicals that you mentioned that are, um, of, you know, global concern. Uh, uh -huh. but, um, say that, what was that? So, so yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. Just trying to jump to it, jump to the answer. All right, with, um, thank you very much, Ms. Campbell Anderson, um, Bob and Ray, one of my favorites. Someday we'll enact slow talk. The slow talker? Yeah. Uh, Are you familiar with the one, Mr. Chairman? America. Are you familiar? With the one where, where he keeps asking questions that have already been answered, he's obviously not listening. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, um, not necessarily. Uh, we're we're, we're going to go to a non-slow talker. Thank you so um, much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ms. Cohen. Good morning. Thanks for joining good morning. us. Morning. Thank you for having us. Uh, for the record, Andrea Cohen with Vermont Electric Cooperative. I'm on a pretty small screen, so if I don't see you uh, and you need to interrupt, just rely on your voice because I'm trying to navigate a small screen. Thank you for having us in. I'm going to um, focus most of my comments on community solar. Um, at the end, if there's time, I'd love to offer a few comments on some of these other topics, renewable energy standards and uh, storage, but I think those are topics for a a whole nother day and I can bring in witnesses and discuss, uh, um, some of our experts to discuss that with you. But what I'd really like, if, if it's okay with you, is to focus on our community solar program and share some information about that. And I will uh, share my screen and I have some slides. Sure, that's great. I mean, we'll that because going. as I was saying at the outset, we're really here to talk about in a very open way, how do we bring more community sc scale um, and lower costs for renewable energy in, into Vermont. And so you all have been doing that. So it's great not to talk so much about the bill, but to also to hear about a, so the, the work you've already done and are doing now. So thank you. Great, right. well, thank you for the invitation. And we're excited you wanna talk about community solar because uh, VEC has been engaged in community solar for a few years now. And this is one of our favorite programs. We are so excited to have this program and offer this program and it checks a lot of boxes for us in terms of bringing uh, cost-effective local renewable energy to all of our members, um, an opportunity 
in that space. So I'll just walk through you know, what we're doing and what we've learned and maybe it can serve as a model for some of what you're thinking about going forward in terms of community energy. Um, so VEC Community uh, Solar, uh, the things that we think are great about it, it's cost effective. Um, it brings direct value to par participants as well as co-op members. And I say that in a positive way, uh, such that we're paying market-based prices and we're not having to shift costs to other customers. So for us, that is what we mean by cost-effective, bringing renewable energy in a cost-competitive way. The projects are well-cited. Um, your bill has like siting adjusters, things like that. We don't need that because we're controlling where these projects go. So we know that uh, through our RFP process, we're directing the, the bidders to make them be places where it's optimal from the grid perspective. They're very efficiently cited. Um, as I said, we're local renewable energy. Um, we retire all the recs for all the panels that are sponsored by members. So that helps us meet our RES um, goals and requirements. Uh, it's inclusive. And what we mean by that is you don't have to have a site that is sunny. Uh, you don't have to own your own home. You don't even have to make a long-term forever commitment. Um, so this opens up and invites people to be part of our energy future in a, uh, that otherwise could not. So maybe their site isn't suitable, they don't have a good roof, it's not sunny, they don't own their home. Those folks are able to participate in community solar through our program. Um, there's an exit option, which means people can opt out at any time. Um, typically it's a 10 year commitment, but if they decide after year one that they're just not interested, or frankly, if they move or they need their money back or whatever it is, there's no questions asked they can receive a prorated share back from their original sponsorship. Um, and it's affordable because we have financing options that still allow the people that uh, sponsor panels to have a positive outcome financially. The current status of the program, uh, this is as of this month, we have 28,400 panels in the program. That's about over seven megawatts worth of solar at three well-located sites. We have one megawatt in Alberg, five in Grand Isle, and 1.3 in Heinsberg. Uh, for our service territory, these are locations that are close to load. So that is very important from a grid efficiency perspective. Um, to date, we have about 19% of the panels have been sponsored by 211 participants. That's 5,338 panels that are sponsored. Um, here's what they look like. This is a uh, thank you to Encore, who's our project partner on two of our three projects. These are the first two are their photos. Um, Alberg is the one megawatt. You can see um, that's an aerial. Heinsberg, the 1.3 megawatt. And then this is the Grand Isle site, which is the larger one. That's five megawatts. So these are local Vermont-based renewable energy. Um, Thank you. Thank you for showing us what a meta megawatt is. Right. Right. Really helps to take a look and see what that means. Um, well, we have to explain this stuff to our colleagues. And if we don't right. know what the number means, we're right. lost. Right. Just numbers. Thank you. Um, it, it, well, what you'll see is those look like other solar projects, right? What's, what's different? It's not the project itself that looks different. It's just how it was uh, brought about through a competitive RFP process and how the opportunity is available to members to sponsor. And that's the innovative part of this, not what the panels look like or what the site looks like, but the financing and the sponsorship. Um, it's kind of, uh, for people that are new to the concept, it's like a farm CSA. Members pre-buy their shares and then they receive their value back over time and they net, it's net positive. They, they end up having more back than what they originally paid and it's benefiting the greater community. And again, I'll, I'll mention there's no cost shift um, involved. So just to give you an example, and this is all on our website, everything is out there for your looking at uh, in more detail. I highlighted one example. This is approved by the PUC. This is what the sponsorship levels look like. 
And whether it's one panel or 67, it's just a multiplier. The, the per panel cost is the same. And how it works, say you have a bill, a monthly bill that's about $100. And so look at the highlighted line. When you talk to our member service team, they might say, well, if you wanna cover your entire bill, uh, you might wanna sponsor about 36 panels. The upfront payment is $8,451. That's a lot of money, we, we appreciate that. People don't need to sponsor their full bill. They can sponsor one panel if they want all the way up to their full bill. Uh, and there's financing opportunities. So if you don't have that kind of cash, there's still a way to do this. Um, what you could see is if you sponsor at that level, you would get a monthly bill credit every month, the same amount, set monthly bill credit for 10 years of $97.92. That is guaranteed by us. That will happen. It doesn't matter if the sun never shines, you will get that bill credit. And it's set and predictable. Over the course of the year, you could do the math, you're gonna get $1,175. Over the 10 years, times that by 10, you're going to get over 11, almost $12,000 in bill credits. And you're going to net $3,299 over those 10 years. On the right side, you could see if you needed, uh, if you wanted to take a loan, we have a financing partner. And you could see the monthly loan would be $89.59, which is still less than what the monthly bill credit is. So even if you had to finance the whole thing, you come out ahead on a monthly basis. This was an attempt to make this accessible to people of all income levels. As you and we are all learning, folks that are going paycheck to paycheck are not interested in taking out financing. So the opportunity, the barrier and the opportunity, I'll hit on another slide about how we can help all income levels access and be engaged in, in a renewable energy future. So to repeat, it's cost effective. We're not paying above market rate for this energy. We're not shifting costs. It's scalable. You can, you can sponsor one panel or your entire electric bill. Uh, it's zero risk to be a participant. The sun never has to shine. You're gonna get a fixed monthly bill credit. You can leave at any time. Maybe you're a renter and you just don't feel like you can make that kind of commitment. That's fine. No questions asked. You can leave and you'll get reimbursed for prorated. Um, the site we discussed and uh, the lag time. And this I think is really relevant to the discussion about your bill. We are set up and rolling. So there is no lag time. If you were a member and you decided this morning that you wanted to sponsor, we would have you signed up by the afternoon. You'd still have to send us a check or get the financing, but essentially you'd be enrolled. Um, if, if there is money available for community solar, we can access that and get low income people or other people enrolled you know, within a day. So um, that is a real benefit to this program. We've made the investment, the, the program is in place. And again, to emphasize they're well cited, we can cite these where it makes sense from a grid perspective. So the key component, I think, uh, the takeaway is you're thinking about your bill and opportunity is the competitive bidding process. Your bill, um, I know, was drafted some time ago already, and I think there's lessons learned that things that require rulemaking and adjusters and all that get pretty complicated pretty quick, and they never catch up with the market. So you get a perfect system in place, and next month, all of a sudden, the rates you know are better, and you you don't get to take advantage of that. So. Uh, the competitive bidding process, I think, is a, an important component of any community solar program that you might be considering. Um, energy equity, just to put a point on that, um, we've been to this committee before. I won't go through for time. You know, our we're relatively lower income service territory compared to other parts of the state. And uh, when you have 43% of your members on fixed incomes and 14%, this is two years ago, probably more now are unemployed or underemployed, um, you, cost effective renewable energy is, is at the top of our list. Sometimes it's perceived as you're not supportive enough of renewable energy. We are 100% supportive of renewable energy. Uh, we just don't want to pay more than we need to. And I'll just uh, share some recent news that our board of directors recently made a commitment back in February to be 100% renewable by 2030, getting well ahead of, of the, the state requirements. They were even more 
uh, they prioritized um, carbon-free energy supply as, as the most important thing and accelerated that to be 100% carbon-free power supply by 2023. So in two years, we're committed to being carbon-free. Thank I you. I raised that. Much. Oh, who is that? Thank you very much. Oh, Senator Westman is on our board of directors and supported that um, enthusiastically. So thank you for that. Um, so for energy equity, you know, cost effectiveness is key, and um, that's how we go about doing our renewable energy. This this is a slide. I won't go deep because I didn't create this slide and I don't want too many questions on it. I'll bring back Greg Gini, but the point being, um, we, we looked at net metering 1.0, net metering 2.0, uh, PPAs for our community solar and standard offer. And no surprise, if you look at the last two columns, when you go out to bid and you create a competitive situation, you're gonna get more favorable rates. So we could talk about this when we have more time, but I just wanted to share um, that's, that's why we're approaching community solar the way we are. So the opportunity, um, we, we think there's a lot more opportunity to have all income levels participate in our energy, clean energy future. I think we've all just not done a good enough job with that. And so that's our priority. When we look at different initiatives, um, you were talking about mandates maybe for storage. We don't support that. We're we are absolutely incentivized to bring cost-effective storage to our system, and we're doing it right now. Um, and we're, again, lessons learned. If, by us doing it through uh, competitive bidding, we're getting good prices, and we're getting to locate storage where it makes the most sense. We kind of can't think of a worse thing than you telling us where to put storage. <laughs> like That would be just not a good direction to go, in our opinion. So. Um, we, we can talk more about that if you get into it. But back to the opportunity, if there is funding available and we've been talking to DPS about this a lot um, and we've been seeking grant funding, what we think would be ideal is if we could help buy down the cost of panel sponsorship for folks that might income qualify. Uh, we've sought some grant funding. It did not happen. It, it didn't come through because COVID happened and everything got derailed, but we have you know, a turn, an operation ready to go. If tomorrow somebody said, here's 10 bucks, put it towards low income, we can get people enrolled like without any lag. We don't have to go out to bid. We don't have to find new sites. We don't have to develop a program. We've, as you saw, we have a lot of capacity still ready and um, uh, available. And since we've made those investments already, 100% of any grant funding or support will go directly to members. Uh, we would not need to access any of that for admin, project development, anything like that. So if you see opportunities, we really urge your support in bringing, you know, making that opportunity happen. And we'll continue to pursue grants and other things. Um, we have a video on our website, on our community solar page that kind of, it's just a few minutes and really explains the program. If you wanna refresh for yourself what I just went through, and um, again, the website has all the FAQs and everything on that. So um, that's what I wanted to screen share. Um, I did just wanna mention a few other things. I discussed the board commitment to going carbon free. Um, I, think, I think just the, the feedback about the bill, uh, keeping it really simple, um, if I could, you know, if I was drafted, I'd strike out all those sections having to do with setting rates and rulemaking and, and just challenge all of us to take our um, projects and open it up in a, in a way for community solar sponsorship. I think we could do more of that. Um, I wanted to share one image. Um, and I so you know, we're working with Rev on a few things to facilitate storage. Um, and I think regulatory certainty, the department has a bill that would set the regulatory framework for storage. Uh, financial certainty, Olivia mentioned um, that there's some uncertainty about uh, taxing of storage. This is new emerging technology. We're going out to bid the developers that we work with. And as we're looking at proposals, there's some big question marks in the financial analysis about what is, how are these things taxed? 
What are we going to have to pay in property tax and state tax? And we're just all guessing right now. So we're not looking for exemptions per se. We're looking for clarity and certainty, you know, paying our fair share, but knowing what that is, is very important. Um, and we don't know that. So I, I do hope we can talk to you about that at some point with Rev. And I would just will share uh, the conversation about how is distributed generation going in the state? Well, this is VEC's look. Um, this is the cumulative. So yeah, if you look over the past few recent years, you'll probably see a decline in net metering applications, but we tend to look at things cumulatively and say, over the course of the year, how are we doing? And if you look at the yellow, that is the um, net metering solar. So, you know, if the increases may be smaller the past few years, we actually feel like that's appropriate as the market has developed and stabilized and should settle a little bit. You know, you by policy wanted to jumpstart that and you sure did, you know, and um, that's great. And now it's kind of settling and we feel like that's appropriate, but overall we still have more um, net metered solar, you know, this year than the year before, than the year before, than the year before. So that's just, you can look at the data in a lot of different ways. Um, this is what's kind of meaningful to us right now. So I just okay. wanted to share that. Uh, and Ms. Cohen, is that graph, is that for VEC territory? Yes. Okay. Yes. And I'm sure the state folks can give you the statewide picture, but that's for us. Right. So um, I tried to hit 1015, I was pretty close, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, that was very helpful. Um, any committee questions? Senator Westman? Um, could you talk very briefly about um, storage? Yeah, um, we have a, store, a standalone storage um, project in Heinsburg that has been operational over a year now. And um, it basically looks like people, to Senator Mc, um, McCormick's um, concern, it basically looks like two roll-off containers. And it's not fancy, it doesn't look like much, but it's community scale and it is saving the co-op money. And we use the same model that we did for community solar. We went out to bid, we have a project partner who, you know, bought the materials, installed, and is running it for us at a, at a contracted price. And we are saving money already, and we are looking to do more of these. Um, we're in the middle of negotiating our next storage project, um, which I referenced because we do have some uncertainties, the finance. I think um, what is stopping storage now, um, and if you did have a storage bill, we would come testify and say, is just, it's still really new, so it's still really expensive. But as the market starts adjusting and more utilities are interested, you know, we already see the prices are going to start, you know, coming down. Um, it's one of those things we we would say what we need from you is regulatory certainty, any financial certainty like around the taxes, and then let us do what we do best, which is manage the system in the most cost-effective way. Um, the goals for storage, we're totally self-interested. We, we have all this distributed generation on the grid. We wanna make sure we're peak shaving and doing things and driving you know, efficient uh, use of the grid. So we, we don't think we need your help with that, but we're happy to talk about that. Um, for storage at the home level, uh, how how is that handled? I mean, is there a tariff for the power that comes out of it, or is it all entirely behind the meter? So, yeah. if the customer is drawing off their battery, they just seem to have a lower load, and you don't you're not really aware of what's going on. We have members uh, who have batteries right now and are doing what they do, and right from where we sit, it looks like they're just using less energy when they're using the stored energy. Um, what we are about, and we keep saying we're about to launch and we're really frustrated because it's been very hard to get the deal in place, but any day now we're being launching an opportunity for members who have batteries or want to get into battery storage to work with us and get, uh, share the value with us that we can um, partner with them to utilize their battery to help us 
do management of PEEP. And so it will be a value proposition. It will be totally opt into the member. So if you had a battery, we would say to you, hey, if you let us um, manage that battery when we're going to have a peak event and use the battery, you know, two or three times a month, um, we will give you this much in a monthly bill credit. You, of course, have the opportunity to override that and say, no, no, I'm, you know, have guests this month and I never want to not have hot water, whatever it is. Um, and you just wouldn't get the bill credit. So we, we are, you know, really close to launching that opportunity to our members. Um, it's been in partnership with third parties. So that's been some of the challenges working out the deal, but we're getting there. And so Josh, I know, and GMP have more experience with this. They've gotten ahead on that. So he can probably answer those questions well, but it's a value, it's a, it's a value share. You know, we get benefit, they get benefit and yeah. we work out something um, through our tariffs. Okay, and I was gonna say, have you filed a tariff for the value of storage? And, or do you need to have a tariff for storage to assign a, a value per kilowatt hour? You know, I have to get back to you on that. I don't know okay. what we've done. I'm thinking the large storage, you know, we've got a CPG and everything. I don't know yeah. if there's any tariff part yeah. of that. And then uh, the residential, I'm not sure, but Josh would know whether they have one. So. Okay, great. All right. So if there are no more committee comments or questions for Ms. Cohen, um, rather than go to break, because I sense we're going to have a tight fit to get everything done this morning, I'd like to just push on and um, ask thank Mr. You. Castengay to go first, uh, and then we'll take a break, uh, a, a little shorter break than it's on our schedule. Good morning, Mr. Castengay. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, us. Senator. Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, Glad you were right. The record. Glad you were right in the on deck circle, ready to go. Okay. Yes, no problem. Yeah, th yeah th for the record, um, Josh Castingay, uh, Vice President, Chief Innovation Officer at Green Mountain Power. Um, so, nothing to present. I'll just chat for a few minutes and then happy to take uh, questions. Um, so, you know, I just want to talk a little bit about community storage and just kind of stepping back to something GMP has been thinking a lot about over the last year, really, which is how to continue to get, how to connect more Vermonters with, with solar built in Vermont, how to drive new distributed generation in Vermont while reducing the cost, while siting it in a way that's going to be sustainable from an electric uh, system standpoint. Um, and so that has led us to really look at the, the idea of community solar uh, quite a bit. And in fact, we've got a, um, you know, as, as Mr. Farrell will probably talk about, we've got some work as well with, with Encore and a pretty unique setup with a large customer who has uh, carbon goals of their own, Middlebury College, and uh, tying that to a local larger scale distributed solar project um, and flowing those benefits through directly to the college. And it's, it's a really interesting model and one that we think could be repeated as well. So basically, you know, you're looking to get the economies of scale when you can get up to in the three to five megawatt uh, project size range. You look at the siting of it uh, in terms of what, what circuits uh, are they on? Where is it located electrically, both from a distribution system, the part that GMP really focuses on, as well as from a bulk transmission piece, which is what Velco um, looks at. And, you know, and interestingly enough, I think one of the things that Velco's long range plan, which they'll, I, I, they may um, be in to talk about at some point, shows that, you know, we can continue to build um, a considerable amount when you look at uh, the siting strategically and make sure that you take that into account as you think about where you're putting it uh, with respect to the grid. So um, one of the approaches that we like, and I believe you know, Ms. Cohen talked about as well, is using an RFP model. I mean, you know, basically um, going out to the market. I mean, it's, it's, it's similar to how the standard offer has worked essentially. It's just through an RFP process. Um, which we've done a few of in the past, and that helps to to find um, the most cost-effective projects, and then you can work into that um, a process to help with with the siting. There could be some kind of a transparent weighting or something that really focuses on where are these projects being located from a grid perspective to make sure they're producing the most benefit. And at the end of the day, not you know uh, benefiting the customers that are taking part and not negatively impacting all of the customers. Um, and there's, as we've seen with, with the project in Middlebury, there's ways to do that um, 
that uh, will, will work really well. The, the, um, there's been discussion of, of storage and again, happy to take other questions there as well. The um, GMP has done a few different things, both from the residential scale and um, the larger scale. I do, the notion of pairing storage uh, with solar is, pr is pretty important to us. It obviously pr produces that resiliency benefit that's really important, whether it's at the, the home scale or as we're starting to learn with, with our pant and microgrid, like at the larger scale, we can actually look at islanding portions of our system and create more resiliency there, more greater reliability for those customers. Um, it also provides us that flexible resource where we can soak up the solar during the day, use it during the peak hours, reduce costs, reduce carbon for all of our customers. So a really important piece. Um, and then thinking about, you know, just stepping back a little bit from the community solar, the other thing that we think a lot about is just diversity of, of resource. One of the uh, storage is playing a really important role in terms of helping us to move that solar around during the day. But we're also thinking a lot more about um, seasonally in the wintertime and, and even nighttime and where storage may not get you all the way, just that importance of having other, other resources, ideally new resources that fill in some of those other times as well. I mean, digesters can play a big role there in Vermont. Uh, hydro and wind, you know, whether it's in or out of state regionally, new resource there is very, uh, very good complement in the wintertime to solar. So just in terms of a little more broad, some of the things that we think through there. Um, you know, what, what Ms. Cohen talked about, the model that VEC has is, 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 is an excellent model. That's a really good example of um, a community solar model that's, that works really well. It's fairly simple and straightforward. Um, and you, did, you know, has used a similar process to get really cost-effective, well-located projects moving forward there. In terms of what, you know, what other things, you know, there's been talk about, um, I believe the recommended budget from the governor and, and sources of funding that could be used to actually help lower and moderate income Vermonters get connected to, to solar and, and um, have a, a low-income community solar program like that where we can leverage uh, those dollars to buy down the cost and produce credits for low-income Vermonters would be really supportive of that and think there's opportunity there and actually a way to do that really quickly if that were uh, to come to fruition where we could help uh, more Vermonters get connected. So that's, you know, I think at a high level, I just say very supportive of community solar approach, something that we're already engaged in and, and doing in one respect and looking at other programs that we could roll out, looking at RFP opportunities to get more, looking at location, looking at, um, at cost and, and all of those things to help deliver a program like this to, to more Vermonters and get folks connected there. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and I'm happy to take questions. Great. Um, well, thank you for that. And um, are there, um, Ms. Cohen was mentioning uncertainty, which is always unfriendly to, to any kind of business. Uh, I mean, it, it creates challenges, usually drives costs up to cover them. Are there any legislative needs that you might see for the coming year or two? I mean, we've talked about funding that would allow lower income, low income Vermonters to become owners or, or, or subscribers on uh, uh, solar generation, for instance. Um, but that's just a sort of a seems like a pure funding challenge. Uh, how about legislatively uh, policy or statutory changes that support where you would like to go, but you're not quite able to do this yet because the laws don't help you? You know, I think, um, I think you hit it in terms of the key one around the funding opportunity. When it comes to the, the programs, I, I I believe you know within the regulation we have today, we're we're able to roll these out. Um, the 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 Middlebury example that I gave, um, we went through the PUC process. We used what's called a, a special contract process, which is which is essentially like a tariff um, uh, to to do the first project, and that could be something turned into a a, a more permanent tariff offering. Um, the community solar model that we're exploring now, I, and one of the things I should I should add to that too. Um, the other thing that we're looking at as we're looking at community solar ideas is also how do you help, you know, one of the best things that we can do to continue to drive more distributed solar in Vermont is to also electrify the other aspects of our, of our energy sector, transportation and thermal. Because when we do that, 
And when we do that in a way that, that creates electric load during the day, we're, we're, we're soaking up the solar, we're reducing carbon, we're reducing costs, and we're helping to be able to site more solar on the grid because it's, it's, it's soaking it up more locally. So um, we're thinking about that as we look at our community solar program, but that can be done uh, as, far as, as far as we believe through, the, through a pair of existing processes that we have today. Um, so legislatively, I think the, the potential for funding to support uh, low income programs um, and to help buy down some of those costs, I think would be one of the key things there. Well, thank you very much. Um, so committee, let's pause here. I'm looking at the list of witnesses. Speaking of buffet lines and putting too many things on a plate, I think I may have done that in building the agenda. Um, so let's just take uh, a five minute break. 10 it's 10.30 now, we'll reconvene at 10.35. And um, we'll just ask the remaining